Are you a masochist who also has an unhealthy obsession with coffee? Then here's several minutes of the most frustrating way to get a better cup. It's worth it though. Well, maybe. I'll let you be the judge. As always, before we get started, full transparency, Suhas, the founder of Banky Brewing Tools, sent us his unit and said, hey Raghu, tell me what you think. Should I stock these? So instead of just answering that question by doing a review, we thought it would be much better to tell you everything you need to know about refractometers. So by the end of this video, you'll know what a refractometer is, why it's useful, how it should be used to get accurate readings, Unfortunately, it isn't as straightforward, so we break down the entire workflow. And lastly, if you should get one. And we'll cover all this while we simultaneously review the dye fluid R2 extract. We'll share our thoughts on design, how it performs compared to the Otago, and whether it's the first budget refractometer you should even bother with. Considering pretty much all the other budget options seem wildly inaccurate and useless for filter coffee, with just a few, including the R1, which is the predecessor to the R2, being just barely usable for espresso. No money exchanged hands and Suhas, Benki, or Dye Fluid had no say in what we've put in this video, and they don't get to watch it before any of you do. So with that out of the way, here's our honest review of the Dye Fluid R2 extract. Okay, have we legitimately lost the plot? Because I'm sitting here talking about refractometers. Yeah, if you're rolling your eyes or wondering what the hell I'm on about, I do not blame you. It was not so long ago that we thought using scales to brew coffee was ridiculous, but that's now even more common than overheated milk at a cafe. Okay, maybe not that common, but the point I'm trying to make is that I'm starting to see more and more refractometers in home brewer setups. And that's pretty nuts because these devices are not cheap. I mean, even this budget R2 is $200. So let's break it down and look at what it is and whether you should maybe consider buying one. Okay, so what the hell is a refractometer and why are we talking about science lab equipment on a coffee channel? All very valid questions, so let me explain and bear with me for a second. I'll try and keep this quick and simple. So light travels at around 300,000 kilometers per second in a vacuum, but slows down and bends when traveling through different mediums. And this change in speed is expressed as a number called the index of refraction. For example, Water has a refractive index of 1.33, which means it moves 1.33 times slower in water than it does in a vacuum. Now, a coffee refractometer basically shines a light through a sample of coffee and uses the change in refractive index compared to that of distal water to determine the percentage of total dissolved solids. Coffee is around 30% soluble, so using the TDS reading and some simple math, we can calculate the extraction yield percentage which tells you how much of this soluble material or yummy stuff you've managed to extract from your coffee. This is very useful information, especially when used in conjunction with taste and can become a very powerful tool for validating and troubleshooting. So hopefully that explanation was clear as to what it does and why it's useful. We still need to talk about temperature's effect on refractive index, but I'll save that for a little later on where it'll be more relevant. Now let's open up the box and look at what's inside and talk about design. As you do with any product, the first thing you interact with is the packaging. And in this case, it's very high quality. The clear foiling looks sick. It's like liquid on matte black and very apt for the product that it houses. I just wish they hadn't used the silver and copper bling. It kind of cheapens the look in my opinion. Opening it up, we have the manual and under that the R2 extract refractometer a cute little spoon to get the coffee sample onto the lens and a faux leather pouch. Under the R2, you get a nice microfiber cleaning cloth and a USB-C charging cable. So yeah, nicely laid out and a pretty enjoyable unboxing experience overall. So we're off to a good start. Now coming to the product itself, the flattened pill shaped form is clean and minimalistic and just looks way nicer and more refined than its predecessor, the R1. It is also tiny and makes the VSC refractometer, which is the industry standard, look like a dinosaur in comparison. 
But that being said, the plastic does feel a bit cheap and sort of flimsy and makes you wonder about the longevity. The Otago, on the other hand, definitely feels like it's built with higher quality materials. The Otago, for those of you who aren't familiar, is an excellent cheaper alternative to the VST. I guess we'll have to keep using the R2 and maybe do a long-term review to see how it holds up over time. But coming back to the positives, it's IP67 water resistant, so you really don't have to worry about splashes or even giving this thing a quick rinse. The sample dish is now aluminium and an absolute joy to use after working with the Otago. The slope is much more gradual and there's next to no lip where it meets the lens. And this means cleaning is a breeze. With the Otago, there's a fairly significant lip and it's always a bloody hassle to get into those grooves and clean it. It's also got a nice bright color display which gives you a lot of information but doesn't feel cluttered. And lastly, everything these days, including your baby's diapers, need to have an app that goes with it. And the R2 is no exception. But we're actually pleasantly surprised by it. So let me show you why. The Dye Fluid Cafe app is really intuitive and uncluttered. And if you have the scales that Dye Fluid makes to go along with the R2 extract, then you can do some pretty cool stuff with the app from a brewing standpoint. We unfortunately don't have the scales at this point. So let's take a look at the refractometer side of the app before we brew some coffee and take some measurements to demonstrate our workflow. Pairing was super quick and we can then tap on the R2 to take us into the refractometer section of the app. Here things are pretty intuitively laid out. First up, we click on the three dots and switch to pour over because that's what we're doing today. The workflow for espresso is very similar, but you can choose to filter the samples if you want to. You can then select the standard, which is basically a range of values that define the sweet spot or ideal when you plot TDS versus extraction yield on a graph. These are just ballpark figures, so don't obsess over them too much. Use your taste. You can then switch to the pro view from simple to be able to see a lot more information, and we highly recommend doing this. Then in order to be able to give you accurate readings, the device needs to have a reference for zero TDS. This is called calibration and is done by adding a few drops of distilled water, which obviously has no dissolved solids, to the sample dish and hitting the zero button up here. Then just add your coffee sample, enter the dose, water and yield or beverage weight in grams and tap test. The moment it completes the measurement, you can see both the TDS and the extraction yield percentage and also see where this falls on the graph. You even have the coffee brew ratio in grams per liter visible. So more than enough information. What we also recommend you do is turn on advanced temperature view in the settings, which then shows you calibration temperature and the current sample temperature. This is really useful, but you may be wondering why that is. If you remember, I mentioned earlier that we need to talk about temperature, and this seems like a good time to do that. Basically, as the temperature of a material increases, its density decreases due to thermal expansion. This allows light to travel quicker through it, thereby decreasing the refractive index. This is why it is critical to have the temperature of the distilled water used for calibration to be as close to the coffee sample temperature as possible, preferably within 0.1 degrees. It is a bit of a faff to get the two temperatures to be this close, but we'll show you how we manage this fairly consistently when we break down our workflow. This will ensure that your readings aren't skewed due to temperature's effect on refractive index. These devices do come equipped with temperature compensation, but they aren't very accurate or reliable. Cool, so that's the app. And while it's very nice, we really love that you don't have to use it. The screen on the R2 gives you all the information you need to use the device on its own. Great, so let's take some measurements and look at workflow. Now, working with refractometers truly brings me joy. The same kind of joy I feel when sticking needles in my cuticles. Honestly, with every press of a refractometer button, I lose about 10 to 15 strands of hair. It's beyond frustrating because you have to be really, really careful with your workflow. If you thought you could just brew coffee, chuck a few drops on the sample dish, press a button and call it a day, you, you might want to sit down for what I'm about to show you. Luckily, we have people like Jonathan Garnier and Rohan, aka Pocket Science Coffee, who've gone through the painstaking task of developing a reliable and repeatable way to get usable data. We used to use this metal block called the Magic to cool down the sample, but since watching Lance's insanely detailed and equally nerdy video on refractometers, 
linked in the description below. And more recently, reading Rohan's blog post, which we've also linked to in the description below, we too have switched to the spoon technique. And ever since, my hair loss is reduced by 60%. Can you tell? Anyway, here's what we do, and it's near identical to Rohan's workflow, but with a small additional step. First up, here's what you'll need. Brewed coffee, a refractometer, duh, distilled water, isopropyl alcohol. I like to take the occasional swig to make this delightful process a little more bearable. A notepad with a reminder that isopropyl alcohol is not safe for consumption. A microfiber cloth, preferably two. One for cleaning coffee and the other for water and alcohol. Two cupping or large spoons and one regular one to stir the coffee and transfer the sample. And lastly, a large suitcase full of patients. Cool, so first let's brew some coffee. By the power of editing, I just need to snap a finger and boom. Quick tip, weigh your empty carafe before you brew so you can quickly calculate how much brewed coffee you end up with. This is known as the beverage weight or yield and is basically the total brew water weight minus the water weight absorbed by the coffee grounds. Once you have the coffee, thoroughly mix it with a back and forth motion and take a small sample and transfer that onto a cupping spoon, then give it a few swirls and set it down. This will almost instantly cool the sample down to room temperature and you don't need to worry about evaporation skewing the readings. Next, we prep the refractometer. Yep, it's finicky and needs a little bit of coddling to get it to work right. You can do this before brewing and that's what we usually do when we're measuring espresso. But for pour overs, we do this during drawdown. Prep basically involves cleaning and zeroing or calibration. First, add a couple of drops of isopropyl alcohol onto a microfiber cloth and wipe down the lens thoroughly. Then add a couple of drops of distilled water onto the lens. And again, wipe clean with a microfiber cloth to remove any remnants of the alcohol which can mess with the calibration. Then again, add a few drops of distilled water to the lens and zero or calibrate. With the R2, press once, then quickly again, and you should see the word zeroing on screen. We'll be fancy and use the app. Once that's done, be sure to note the temperature on screen. Then chuck this water out, again, wipe dry, and now you're ready to measure your sample. Your sample of coffee should now be at around the same temperature as the distilled water that you use to calibrate, but we found that transferring it onto another spoon, giving it a few more swirls, and then pouring a few drops onto the lens gets us within the 0.1 degree window a lot more consistently. Give it a few seconds and then press the button to start measuring, and you should soon see the TDS reading show up as a percentage on the screen. Unfortunately, we're not done yet. Shocking, right? You need to continue measuring until you get four consecutive identical readings, and that's when you have your TDS. Okay, don't kill me, but there's still one more step to go and it involves a little bit of math. Hey, math, so much fun. Okay, honestly, bear with me because we're about to reap the reward for all this hard work that we've done, and that's finding out the extraction percentage, or in simpler words, the percentage of yummy stuff in your cup that we've managed to pull out of the coffee. Luckily, there are apps to do this math for you and the Dye Fluid Cafe is no exception. So if you look here, we have our extraction yield percentage. This number, however, is a little pointless unless it's used in conjunction with taste. Another tip here is to always taste the coffee before you measure so it doesn't influence or bias your experience. For example, a coffee may taste great at 15% extraction, but if you had seen that number before taking a sip, then you're much more inclined to go looking for signs of under extraction. Another fun thing to do is take a sip and then try and guess the TDS. It's a great way to train your palate and you'll notice you get better and better over time. Ha, huh. okay, that was a lot. And if you're still watching, then you clearly have a problem. But I feel so much closer to you now that I know that you're someone who's willing to trade your hairline for a better cup of coffee. I respect that. Okay, let's answer the big question. Is the R2 accurate? To be very honest with a device like this, the most important factor is consistency, even more so than accuracy. Hear me out. For example, if you have two samples, A and B, and A reads higher than B when you measure them, the true TDS value of these samples is less relevant in a home and cafe setting than being able to trust that sample A does indeed have a higher TDS than sample B. 
In short, if a refractometer is, say, consistently higher than the true value by around 0.05%, that's all you really need. On the other hand, a refractometer that jumps around randomly is pretty useless and can't really be trusted. Hopefully that makes sense. So keeping that in mind, let's look at how it compared to the Otago, which is widely considered to be very accurate and a solid alternative to the VSD if that's out of your budget. So the R2 consistently, and that's the key word as I just explained, came in within 0.04% of the Otago over 43 different readings and almost always reported a slightly higher value. Factoring in human error and other external factors, this is pretty great news. Now, hang on, before you start shouting in the comments about small sample bias, I get that this is a tiny sample size and also doesn't factor in unit to unit variances, but I've chatted with a few other trusted coffee people who've had very similar results. So given the limitations of our setup and how thoroughly we were able to test this device, combined with the feedback from people we trust, I'd be happy to recommend the R2 if you're in the market for a refractometer. At 200 US dollars when compared to the Otago, which is at around 450, and the VST at 700 plus, the R2 is excellent value. It's cooler looking, feels more modern in terms of design, has new tech, is super portable, has a really nice app that goes with it, and is just overall very enjoyable to use. Well, as enjoyable as using a refractometer can be, that is. It's always nice to see when a company takes feedback and criticism and uses that to make significant improvements. The R2 seems to be a big step up from the R1 across the board, whether that's in terms of design or performance. And having played with it for the last month or so, I'm really excited to get my hands on their scales and also see what they come up with in the future. And on that note, it's time to wrap this one up. We really hope you found this video useful. And if you do get a chance to use the R2, then we'd love to hear your thoughts on how bad the hair loss is. As always, thank you so much for enduring this science lesson. And until next time, brew and measure our arm safe.